Hoping that we don't ask him what he got at his SAT right there, right, uh, Riley? I was actually just trying to think about it. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, my name does start with an M. Yeah, how'd you, so, how'd you um, like that intro, bro? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. He's actually um, – he has not filed uh, to run with Secretary of State yet. So I guess we'll see what happens there. Everybody else is kind of piled in. So we'll see. Got till January 28th, I think, right? 27. 27. Gotcha. So uh, what, what did you think about that approach of uh, let's, let's get rid of all the you West Virginia legacy royalty people in the political world? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard that before. And uh, certainly, look, I don't – I'm not political royalty or anything like that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just somebody who's out here who's been fighting for West Virginians in the two offices that I have held in the legislature, now as state treasurer. I don't want anybody to vote for me because my last name is starts with an M or more for that matter. I want you to vote for me if you agree with what I've done, if you agree with the stances that I've taken against woke corporations and big financial institutions that are boycotting the fossil fuel industry, if you agree that we shouldn't have uh, banks and credit card companies tracking the purchases of your guns and ammunition, which I was able to stop not only in West Virginia but in the country, then vote for me. If you want your retirement dollars protected from being used to further the leftist agenda out there, if that's something you're into, if you're against ESG, if you're pro-life, if you are pro-gun, if you're pro-family, then you should vote for me. If the M is a hang-up, uh, well, there's not much I can do about that. And I also would encourage you, uh, listeners and viewers, to not not vote for someone just because there's an M in their name as well. Uh, in a serious note, uh, we had Nate Kane, another one of your opponents on in the uh, recent past, and he brought up the Podesta group again, Riley. Uh, this is not something that you've run away from. Uh, I remember interviewing you the first time you ran for office and you talked about your employment at the Podesta group, but this is uh, something that your opponents uh, are using against you. Can you tell us about the Podesta group and your time there? Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I feel like we talk about this every election cycle. Um, I know Nate King didn't live here then. Um, well, I guess he didn't live here for the last several election cycles, but that's fine. <laughs> he just moved here. Welcome, welcome to West Virginia. Um, so, but in any event, yeah, um, you know, it, it was an interesting experience, I'd say, for me. Uh, there's times in your life where you learn, I think, who you want to be. And then I think there's times where you have experiences where you learn who you don't want to be. And, uh, yeah, I would worked there. I was a junior staffer there. And then, and, and this is what everybody gets hung up on. They're like, he's a vice president. There was like 40 or 50 of us because instead of getting raises, they just changed everybody's title. And I was like, okay, well, uh, they're like, you're vice president. I'm like, of what? They're like, yourself. Okay. So, um, but yeah, worked there, uh, for a few years. I quit, um, and uh, won an election in 16, quit, and went off and sought other employment. Uh, the group no longer exists. I don't know what else to really say about it, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it really wasn't uh, something that I enjoyed, but it did give me a lot of knowledge uh, about the inner workings of Washington, D.C., and a lot of the corruption that is going on there and a lot of the backdoor dealing that takes place which I think is why I've been so successful at kind of fighting the system here as it relates to the ESG movement and a lot of the uh, confluence and coordination in between government and big business to try to stifle our industries here in West Virginia. So I think, look, I've had kind of an inside uh, insider view of all that, and I think it served me well, and I think it served the people of West Virginia well. But like I said, look, you go through life, sometimes you have some experiences that help you learn who you want to be, and then sometimes you have someone that tell you who you don't want to be, and that certainly was not what I wanted to do uh, for a living and uh, moved on in my career path. And I'm sure in 2026, Rob, we'll talk about this again. We've talked about it 16, 18, 2022. We're in 24, and I'm sure it'll come 
right back around uh, where, you know, Nate Kane or somebody else who just moved to West Virginia will bring it back up. Mr. Stubblefield. Good morning, Raleigh. Uh, hope you're safe and well and not on slippery roads as I was this morning. So it's, but I uh, hope you're doing well. Uh, I am. Uh, Riley, there was a, a, a someone else that entered the race, I think, in the last two or three days. That's, uh, uh, from my observation, I'm pretty talented. And that's uh, General Christopher Mookie Walker. Have you met uh, General Walker before? Uh, I have not met him before, but I've seen him before. He lives in Charleston, uh, West Virginia, mm-hmm. our state capital. And uh, last I heard, he was going to run for county commission in Kanawha County, and now he's filed to run for Congress in a place he doesn't live in. So, um, yeah, no, I've not met him before. Um, I've seen him around the Capitol. I know at one point he, uh, I think, was working for General Hoyer, who's the adjutant general at the time. Uh, But, no, don't know him. Um, I know he's living down there in Charleston, but that's um, other than his record was kind of uh, been reported out there don't know too much about him yeah i i know very little about him i've never met him either uh, i did read uh, watch his announcement this morning uh it was an impressive announcement so it looks like uh of the various candidates he's the one that you would have to probably spend more time following and, and looking at yeah, did he mention where he's running out of? Like, where does he live? No, he did not. He's never, he's, yeah. he's never voted, actually, in the 2nd Congressional District. He's registered mm-hmm. to vote in Charleston, West Virginia. He's never voted here or lived here. So I'd be curious to know where in the 2nd Congressional District he's going to reside uh, before the election. Yeah, no, it was absence on that. In fact, I did not realize he was not in the second until you just mentioned it. Uh, but you, I'm sure you will. You'll go back and look at the announcement. It was, uh, uh, it was well done, professionally well done, and it was, uh, it was quite good. I thought. So. Was that was that like the video? It's like kind of like campaign video. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So. You know, you flag officers always stick together on these things. That's that's. Uh, <laughs> As I said, I've never, well, I've and, never met him. Well, and I got one. We do have another flag officer in the race. Uh, there is a. You're gonna have to forgive me. I can't remember his last name, but yeah, Stephen, uh, and I think it starts with a W. But he uh, he had filed to run in the second congressional district here, 2024, as a Democrat and uh, just submitted his paperwork, it looked like, yesterday, and has switched parties already. Uh, he didn't even get into office. He's already switched parties from a Democrat to a Republican. So now he's running as a Republican. And uh, so I don't think there's actually now any Democrat filed in the race. I'm not sure if somebody will, since he kind of occupied that lane previously. And we're talking, Riley, about for the second congressional district, this new this new guy as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was, he's a retired uh, commander. Okay. Uh, Riley, I know. Uh, go ahead, John. You're about to ask. Yeah, I was just going to ask. I don't know if not a follow on to that, but um, so if, if we project you into the House chamber, we say you've won the election and, and, and now you are the representative of West Virginia. What are your thoughts on um, Mike Johnson as speaker and the uh, compromise that he's reached or tried to reach with um, Chuck Schumer in the Senate? to keep the government open. Is that something you would vote for or against? And, and it appears, by the way, to be losing support within the It Republican does. Well, it's, it's the Freedom Caucus that is is um, doing what the Freedom Caucus does with, with, for good or ill. But where do you stand on, on that sort of thing? Is, is the harmony and comedy important? Uh, well, I think reducing the deficit is important. Um, and I don't think the Freedom Caucus is wrong on this. And certainly Speaker Mike Johnson, um, who was affiliated uh, with the Freedom Caucus, certainly understands that uh, side of it. But there has to be some reduction here. And I think there were some highlights that he'd had in there, particularly as it related to the IRS and the reduction of appropriations to them. But I will say this, in general terms, I am not in favor of omnibus spending bills. I want us to get back into regular order. So what does regular order mean? It means that every subcommittee on the appropriations 
committee will go through their legislative process, pass their bills out of the subcommittee. They go to the House floor. The whole chamber gets to vote on each of uh, uh, 12 appropriations bills individually, and they get sent over to the Senate. That's how you're going to get real reductions in spending, and that's how we're going to get this stuff under control. So omnibus bills where it's, everything's just wrapped up into one, I, I am not a fan of that at all. I do not like them. Back to the, uh, to the bill that was uh, rejected uh, yesterday. I was surprised that the Democrats did not support uh, Mike Johnson on this. I know there's anything that's proposed by the Democrats, the Republicans are automatically are against, and the reverse is true. But the fact that the uh, Democrats in the Senate were very supportive of this agreement, this compromise, I was I say the ones on the House did not support Mike Johnson. Yeah, I'd say that is kind of interesting, though, where the Senate was supporting it, but then the House does not. Yeah, I'm not sure what the inner workings in uh, on that is. I, I would say I'm sure that they're enjoying, I'm sure on the House side, the Democrats are, um, you know, the Republicans having such um, – tenuous issues that they're dealing with and trying to get budgets passed and watching us fight each other. I'm sure that's uh, been something that uh, they're relishing. Yeah, but somewhere in the future, Riley, we've got to come back to the fact we look for the betterment of the country as opposed to trying to embarrass the other party. Yeah, well, it's, I think where you can come back to this idea, you know, betterment of the country, I think it's just we have two different ideas on how to better it, but I'd say everybody's going to get more of a say on how to do that, particularly as it relates to spending, if we can just get back to regular order. That was Thomas Massey over there in Kentucky. That was part of that budget deal that ended up passing under McCarthy was that they're going to go back to regular order. What cost McCarthy his speakership in part was that they were not getting the bills done fast enough to be able to go through the process and which obviously ultimately failed uh, having that a a regular order uh, appropriations process on the House floor. Riley, the third rail of politics, as we've frequently been told, resides with Social Security and Medicare. And we know that both of these programs are uh, are unsustainable the way that we're spending with the income. Would you be in favor of changing either one of these two? Uh, I'd say on Social Security, um, look, as a government, uh, we've made, obviously, commitments to people, and they have been paying into Social Security. I'm not for moving out the retirement age on Social Security at all. Uh, Medicare which obviously is mandatory, not discretionary spending, it's a behemoth. Something has to be done uh, to try to reform that. But, look, we have many, many retirees, not Admiral Stubblefield, but many retirees uh, who are on Medicare. I imagine you're on TRICARE or something like that. So it's that is <laughs> that's something that we have to keep in mind, that that is – we don't. We're not living in a in, in a time right now where there's kind of defined um, benefit retirement plans that are offering health care anymore, right? So everyone, private sector is dumping everybody. You get a 401k if you're lucky, and then obviously you're going to have the ability um, to then just sign up for Medicare, which is expensive. It, it is expensive. It's expensive for the government. It's expensive, actually, for the people that are using it. I'd say it's very clear at the amount of money that's being spent on it that it is a system that does need reforming. There needs to be ways to find uh, some <clears throat> some cost savings there. But outside of Medicare, I think Medicaid is a place where we need to talk about where we can do some real reforms where I think we might be able to save some money. Because not just Medicare, you've got Medicaid on the other side that I think is something that needs to uh, be looked at uh, quite closely and see where we can find some savings there. Uh, Riley, overnight or yesterday, the U.S., uh, in con- con- uh, with the aid or assistance of uh, several other countries, took action in the Red Sea area. Uh, the Democrats are saying that the president was 
it was not appropriate for him to take action unless he had prior approval from Congress. What is your sense on that? Well, it's not just Democrats. There's Republicans that are saying that as well. And, um, look, there's an, there's an escalatory situation that's going on in the Middle East, obviously. Uh, I, I don't like that we're getting spread so thin in uh, our response around the world right now. But, yeah, I don't disagree that if we're going to get into some conflict, Look, the, the authorization for use of military force is done by Congress. Now, look, you were around for this. You remember Vietnam and how that, you know, we had mission creep and how those things took place. And there was no uh, vote by Congress to authorize that war necessarily. And I, that's where I don't want to be. I don't want the United States running around the world getting into conflicts constantly and then congress who represent the people of this country have no say in it so i do think that it is correct that congress needs to have a say in whether we're going to start bombing some other country and getting into some uh, some additional conflict here i would agree with you in most circumstances riley with the exception of the fact that we have such a dysfunctional congress in Washington, D.C., we couldn't get these people to come to agreement on what to order for lunch. If we had to make a quick response somewhere in the world, these people would tear each other apart debating whether or not it affects somebody's constitutional rights somewhere uh, who was elected from a very conservative district in Iowa. This is what this is, this is what we have in Washington, D.C. right now, a bunch of children masquerading around as congressmen. Uh, we need, yeah, we well, need to turn the whole damn imagine. city over and start over. Well, and I don't disagree with you on that, but it's the president does have the authority. He does have the authority to respond immediately to a threat like this. But if we're talking about being engaged in some kind of long-term conflict, look, that's uh, the 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 uh, the declaration of war can only be done by Congress. And obviously, we've skirted around that with AUMFs authorization to use for military force, whether it's Iraq and Afghanistan, you still had a vote of Congress on that. But if you're talking about a like long-term conflict that the United States is going to be involved in, in the Red Sea, uh, and around that region, and you know fighting the Houthis there that are obviously supported by the Iranians that are operating inside Yemen, and those are their proxies in which we're trying to uh, put down right now, I mean, it's very clear what they're trying to do, right? They're, they're trying to drag us into this conflict with them. The Iranians are through their proxies, the Houthis that are uh, currently within Yemen right now. And look, in my previous job, I've been to Yemen. I, when I worked on the House Foreign Affairs Committee as a staff member, I was in Yemen. I, I understand the issues that are going on there very well. I was on the ground there. Um, actually only about a week or so after the United States had uh, droned the uh, 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 cleric there that had gotten the fellow to uh, jump on an airplane, the underwear bomber, you might remember him. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, I I understand the dynamics there quite well and the conflict that's uh, been precipitating there for a long time between the Sunnis and the Shias, but they're trying to, (laughs) they're baiting us essentially. And we don't want to get dragged down uh, into some type of long-term conflict, I think, without the American people having some type of say in it. The president does have the authority to unilaterally act in a quick manner uh, like this, where perhaps, give an example, we have these destroyers that are out there in the Red Sea that are threatening uh, uh, commercial shipping traffic and things like that, and these missiles are launched uh, by the Houthis, and we struck those out of the sky. Um, sure, that, that, that makes sense. But getting embroiled in some type of uh, sustained conflict, I do think, does take a vote of the United States Congress. Well, there's engagement, and then there's engagement, right? The, um, we don't have <clears throat> boots on the ground in, uh, in most of these conflicts right now. We have uh, forces, static forces that are attacked and defend themselves. But that's different than the the drain on the treasury and the arsenal 
that continues in Ukraine and now in Israel and uh, presumably into the Red Sea area and what have you. At what point does do you think that Congress should intervene? It's a very expensive process. It's not just Congress declares war when and de- declare war commits the entire nation to the war effort a la World War II and previous wars to that. Since then, we've just had this these sort of uh, undeclared wars that have killed thousands of Americans and cost trillions of dollars. Where where do you see the congressional role in that side? Well, you've had AUMF though, right? Uh, we had one. We had one for Iraq. You had one for Afghanistan, right? And yep. So the 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 did take place. Um, yeah. Look, these are expensive endeavors. I mean, you just mentioned uh, Ukraine and. Uh, which is an, uh, it, I, I think has highlighted something very interesting about the United States. And I'm sure our largest adversary in the world right now is taking a very close look at this, and that would be China. The spend rate on the artillery shells over there in Ukraine right now, we cannot keep up with. The United States, we've all now become aware, we only manufacture them in one place, Granton, Pennsylvania. We can only build 15,000 artillery shells a month. Ukrainians are spending over 60,000 a month. So it's coming out of U.S. stockpile and, oh, by the way, a a bunch of munitions that we used to keep in reserve in Israel. The Biden administration a year ago diverted over to the Ukrainians, which is part of the reason now that you need a package for the Israelis, because the munitions that were supposed to be there in in just-in-case events like they had here with Hamas just recently – we're gone. So it's what it has highlighted to me, though, is if we were to get into some type of conventional conflict, God forbid something like that were to happen, we're not prepared in terms from an industrial uh, from an industrial standpoint. We are not prepared for that. Where we're able to manufacture fifteen thousand artillery shells a month, just in like this war in Ukraine, you got a sixty thousand uh, sixty thousand artillery shells being uh, spent every month. We can't keep up with that. The Russians are able to keep up with that. We're not prepared from an uh, from a defense industrial standpoint to be able to compete with the might of China. China, in the next 10 years, is going to represent 50% of the entire industrial base of the world, which means half of everything is going to be made in China, every product in the world. So that's why, to me, to bring it full circle, if I'm in Congress, we've got to do something to reshore a lot of these jobs that we've been sending overseas. We need to learn, relearn how to make these things. We need to strengthen the middle class. We need to bring these jobs back. I mean, the Admiral can tell you, we, we only have a few shipyards left in the United States. China has more naval vessels now than we do how is that possible and we've just let this happen we've let this happen we let shipyards shut down for years now i think there's only eight left maybe less um it, it, it's hard to believe that this is a position that we're in but it is and so i think reinvigorating our industrial base here in the united states bringing the jobs back home these are good types of jobs the type of jobs we want to see people in and, you know, like a wise man said, you want peace, prepare for war. And I think that's probably pretty apt here. I think we're just about out of time. Um, back into your treasurer's role. I know uh, you are in town. I don't know if you have already done so or you're about to do so, but apparently you're presenting a pretty large check to the local hospital here from the department. I did. I did. Uh, Berkeley Medical Center, just over $30,000. What we've been doing here in the treasurer's office is something I realized, and it's fairly obvious, but we've been keeping closer uh, tabs on it. My predecessor had not done this. Hospitals do a massive amount of transactions, right? So you get insurance claims uh, that go uncashed. You have stale dated checks that go uncashed. They do so many transactions that some of these end up rolling over to our office as unclaimed property because they're not acted upon. So we've been going around to all the hospitals in West Virginia to try to get them back 
the money more immediately rather than letting it sit there. So we've been able to do that now um, in the last year, I think three times uh, for Berkeley Medical Center. We've done that up in Wheeling. We've done it in Huntington, down in Charleston, Beckley, all over the place. So we've been really proud of the work that my staff has been able to do to be able to return that money uh, to the hospitals that provide such critical services for our communities. Riley, how can members of our audience search the treasurer's site to find out if they have any unclaimed property that the treasurer's department is holding? Yeah, so you can go to um, wvtreasury.gov or wvtreasury.com. We own both domains. They go to the same place. And click on unclaimed property. You can put your name in, your kid's name in, aunt, uncle. <laughs> you get You get the gist here. And see if they have unclaimed property. See if you have unclaimed property. There is some uh, documentation requirement around that, but now, happy to say, you can do all of that online. Rod, good to talk with you this morning. It's great talking to you all, too. Thanks so much for having me on. Treasurer Riley Moore, candidate for Congress at 833.